Well, hello everyone. Today I've got the privilege of being here with my uncle. And there's always a big gap of quite a few years and then we suddenly are able to catch up again. And that's because of living on the other side of the world. Yes. And my uncle has been a missionary most of his life, certainly the major part of his life other than his younger days, in Spain. So it's going to be wonderful just to get some stories about that. And so first of all, I'll just start with just how did you know, first of all, Jesus calling you to salvation, but then also the Lord calling you to be a missionary. Now the Lord is, is amazing in the way he deals with people in different ways. And looking back, my conversion was for all the wrong motives. Um, I had, when I was a kid, I had a very dear auntie who looked after me when my mother had two children after me and was over overwhelmed with children. So my auntie kind of adopted me and took me around everywhere. And when I was seven, she died quite suddenly. She caught polio and on Sunday she sang a solo in the church and on Thursday she was buried. And this sudden death devastated me. And I thought that if I died, I probably wouldn't go to be where my auntie was. So my mo main motive in seeking the Lord and wanting to be saved was in order to be with my auntie. Uh, that happened when I was seven. Um, and I think it's true to say that most conversions of children require reconversions in later dates of different sorts. When I was 14 years old, I was teaching Sunday school. I had my ideas clear, but my, my life wasn't clear. I was teaching Sunday school and the following Sunday I had to give a lesson on the second coming of Jesus. It was a beautiful day clear blue skies, so I went into the countryside near our house in order to prepare. And as I was sitting there, I began to question, do I really believe that Jesus is coming back? And I looked up at the sky. And I thought, if there had been clouds in the sky, it would be easier to be believe but with a clear blue sky, it's not so easy. <laughs> um, and then I decided that I really didn't believe that in order to be coherent, I should tell the elders of the church that I'd lost my faith and therefore I resigned as a sons of school teacher. And so I'd made up my mind to do that and started for home again. I was in tears. It was a, a big thing for me. And as I was going to our home, I suddenly thought of, the, of Jesus' question to Peter after the resurrection. Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And it was as if Jesus was asking me that question and so my immediate reaction was well it's a silly question because how can I love you if I don't even know if you exist or not I thought that was a brilliant answer and so I continued going home and the question came a second time and I more or less repeated the same answer First, I need to know if you exist, if you're really there, and then I'll tell you whether I love you or not. 
and then it came a third time and this, this time I was more honest and said no I don't love you I fear you but I've never really loved you and that was a I can't explain the logic of it, but that was uh, an experience that changed me because I came to understand that it's not only a question of theor theoretical intellectual answers, it's a question of life answers and a question of entering into a personal relationship with Jesus, not only believing the right doctrines. I'll just explain a little bit of our relationship and family, because yeah. I think of my grandparents, your parents, such awesome servants of God, and mm -hmm. they came from England to here in New Zealand. Of course, there was three children, yourself being the oldest, then my auntie Jill, mm. and then my mother being the youngest. Mm. And it's, it's, we've just had my mother's funeral, and it was like celebrating her life as a servant of God and her going to heaven. Mm. And I know one thing you said about how the youngest is, has gone first, uh, so yeah, we never know how long we've got to live, no. and we have to prepare our hearts. But thank you for explaining your salvation. But one thing you mentioned was about your auntie, yeah. which I presume was Auntie Ruth. Yes. And I remember Nana <laughs> giving me Ruth's diary, and oh, it really? was quite amazing of her personal relationship with God. Mm -hmm. And I know that you were so young when she went, but do you just remember anything else about her walk with the Lord? I really was too young to analyse her walk with the Lord. I knew a lot about her walk with me. Um, it was the post-war years and things were tight. Uh, there was little money and little possibility of buying it, anything if you had money, because everything was rationed. Auntie Ruth saved the ration coupons so that she could buy me different things, lollies and, and other, other things, toys. And she, she really spoiled me. She took me around to different places but she was a lovely lovely character a lovely character and when she died I cried for days in fact I cried so much that her husband by then she had married her husband became quite angry with me and said I'm her husband you're only her nephew you shouldn't I should be the one crying not you um, so I, I discovered more of her walk with the Lord through what my mother told me later than through what I saw myself. But yes, she was a lovely Christian. Um, the, the song she sang on the Sunday was In Heavenly Love Abiding. No change my heart sh shall fear. And say I'm safe in that confiding, for nothing changes here. Um, every time I hear that hymn, uh, I think of her and get rather emotional. I'll just ask if you can give us also a little bit of what kind of church background you had there in England. Yeah. I grew up in a Brethren Assembly in which my father and my two grandfathers were all elders. Um, in some ways it was a very good church, 
certainly there was very good teaching. We had lots of well-known Bible expositors come to the church to teach us, and the elders themselves were fairly competent. Uh, at the same time, it was a church which, like unfortunately, like many churches, had a lot of tensions among the members, and finally, it came. These tensions came to a head. It affected not only the church but also our family because um, my grandparents uh, didn't agree with my father on everything. And when the split came, the grandparents were on one side and my parents were on another and it was a very, very difficult moment. As often happens, it was the split was about trivial matters which should never divide Christians, but beyond that there was there were a lot of personal animosities which shouldn't exist among Christians either, but unfortunately did. Actually, it was. It, it was very interesting. A few months back, uh, some friends of ours decided to invite us on a trip to England from Spain uh, to visit the places where I had grown up. And so we went to this Brethren Church in a town called Red Hill and found it was midweek when we went, but it was open and found that midweek the church building is used by an organization that is dedicated to looking after the homeless and so the church we arrived at about 12 midday just as they were serving a free meal to the homeless from the town and it was very interesting to see the church building used on Sunday as a church and midweek used by this organization, Christian organization. Then we went to the town where we grew up after the church split that I've mentioned, a town called Holy, and there we visited a church we used to go to and lo and behold it's now used midweek as a creche, uh, a school for little little tiny children and all the mothers of the area can take their children and I don't know whether they have to pay something or whether it's free but the children are, look, are looked after by women from the church and this means that the women from that area become accustomed to entering a church building without prejudice and therefore more likely to attend church activities when they're invited. And then the church is, is used for services on, on Sundays. So that was my second church. Then I went to uni university and got involved with what is the English equivalent of TSCF in New Zealand? Um, actually, a worldwide organization of trying to evangelize university students. And there, um, for different reasons, I attended a whole series of churches Baptist churches, Congregational, Presbyterian, Anglican. Um, Pentecostal, because I had I felt responsible pastorally for a number of younger students who all came from those denominations, and so I accompanied them to their churches to make sure they went. <laughs> and since then, we have I've 
I find it very difficult to say what I am. I'm a, a Christian, I'm an evangelical Christian, but I don't particularly consider myself anything more than that. Now I want to get on to how God called you to be a missionary to Spain. Mm. And I know you've been there so many years, probably before I was born. You've certainly had a long, interesting journey in, in preaching the gospel in Spain, but how did, it, how did you know that that was your calling? It's a long story. Uh, I'll try to keep it brief. Um, as I said, I think right at the start, the Lord has mysterious ways of directing us and calling us in life. And uh, some of the, those ways, ways we're not even aware of when they happen. Only, only looking back can we see the hand of God in different circumstances. When I was about 15, I had to, at high school, I had to choose to learn another language. We had to choose, we were already learning Latin and French but we had to learn, choose between German, Spanish and Classical Greek. Only a few weirdos wanted to do Classical Greek. But we were in the school gymnasium and the headmaster said we had to get into three groups according to what we wanted. So I went to the German group because all my friends wanted to do German and, and that was considered, well, it was mainly the the bad boys, the louts, louts in the school who wanted to do Spanish. Um, so I didn't want to do Spanish, I didn't want to do classical Greek, so I went to the German group. Then the headmaster said that we were too many in the German group, and so unless we had a very concrete reason for studying German, we should go to the Spanish group. And of course, nobody moved. So then the Spanish teacher came and said, which of you is David Burt? That's me. So I'd, I'd never seen him before. And so I said nervously, me, sir. And he said, well, why do you want to study German? I don't know, sir. Well, then get in the Spanish group. So that's how I started studying Spanish. The reason he picked me out was that he had taught my father French a generation back and thought it would be nice to teach my father's son. But I didn't know that at the time. So that's how I started studying Spanish. Towards the end of my time at university, I needed to practice spoken Spanish more because it was generally assumed that everybody knew how to speak it. Well, I didn't. Um, so I tried different ways of getting to Spain to be able to speak it. I wrote to all the missionaries that I knew of who were working in Spain, asking them if they needed a young man to help out for a summer. None of them replied except one. And he said, sorry I can't help you, but try Operation Mobilization. Now, Operation Mobilization was an organization which I was afraid of because they were a bit, well, I thought fanatical. Actually, they were like Matthew, my nephew. Um, they would go out onto the streets and start street preaching and, and other things which I was too shy for. And the thought of coming to Spain with Operation Mobilization, OM, um, was too strong for me. 
but there was no, no other door open. And when I was in the midst of this question, the youth group from a, from a nearby church came to take the Sunday service in our church. It must have been vacation time because I was there. And a girl gave her testimony in the middle of this, this service. And her testimony was mainly about how she had fought against going with Operation Mobilization even though intimately she knew that the Lord was telling her to go with it. And it was as if the Lord was speaking directly to me. And so I found myself going with OM. I had a very bad summer. Um, I came back as thin as a rake. I've never been as thin as a rake ever since. My mother, when she saw me, said, David, what have they done to you? Because I'd lost so much weight in the two months I spent in Spain that summer. The first, the first month was very hard. Um, we were evangelizing a suburb of Madrid, block after block of poor quality flats with, uh, they hadn't built the streets properly around them yet and there, there was completely chaotic. We were with our team leader who only started to count the eight hours every day we had to go door to door when we reached the first door. And after half an hour, I thought, I can't stand this. So I was really thrown in the deep end. Um, I thought, well, with time, I'll get accustomed. I didn't. I survived. And the second month was much better. We were sent down to the south of Spain to a mountainous area of little villages. Um, I had some very interesting experiences there. On two occasions they tried to marry me, uh, marry me off. Um, but I, I won't go into that. Uh, at one town some Catholic seminarists went after us house to house telling the people that these were heretical books and therefore they had to be burnt. And so they organized a great bonfire in the central square and burnt the books that had been we had managed to distribute. But they made a the mistake of puncturing our vehicle, all four wheels, so when the evening came, they returned to the capital, Granada, 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 and we had to stay because we had no vehicle. Um, this meant that we were there without the seminaries, and then the mayor and some other town councillors, or I don't know what, appeared and apologized for the treatment we re we'd received from the, the seminarists and said, please go door to a door again. And the second time we went round, we sold the, twice as many books as the first time, so. But at the end of that summer, I met um, a university student from England who said to me, the Lord has called me to go to, to come back to Spain when I finish my university studies to try to start a witness for him in Madrid University. Will you pray about whether you will come with me? Because I said to the Lord, I'm willing to go, but please 
find somebody to go with me because you sent out the apostles two by two and so it would be good if someone else came with me. And so I said that I would pray about it. I in fact intimately was not prepared to pray about it because I had had such a, a bad time that summer as I thought that I couldn't face a whole year of evangelizing, going door to door or whatever. But anyway, so I, I made all my preparations. I had one more year of studies and I made preparations to continue studying teacher training, which was only a one year course. And then I would get uh, a job with the Ministry of Education and so I bought all the textbooks I needed. Um, I received, I can't think of the English word, um, a grant from the government to pay for my studies. I hired a room in a house belonging to two old ladies and I had everything set up to do teacher training that following year. But I still needed desperately to have more practice in Spanish. I was coming up to the end of the university course, there were final exams and after the final written exams, a month later there was an oral and the oral exam was what I wasn't prepared for and so I needed to practice speaking more. The only door open was OM again, but no matter how I tried knocking at other doors, all of them were closed and so I found myself going back on OM but it was only for one month this summer and I thought, well, if I survived two months last year, I, I should be able to get through one, one month this summer. On the bus that was hired to take us from England to Belgium, there was a stu uh, another student sitting next to me from the same university as mine and he said, suddenly said, if you decide to, to stay in Spain instead of doing teacher training, let me know because I'd like to, to support you financially. Well, that, that rather annoyed me because he knew perfectly well that I was going to do teacher training and we arrived in Brussels, in Belgium, and went to where they had a conference before sending us out in teams to the different parts. And when I entered the building, the girl in the reception said, oh, there's a letter for you. Well, nobody ever received letters in that conference, so I was very surprised. Anyway, I opened it and it was from a, a a guy in, in my church, local church, and he wrote in his letter, if you decide to stay in Spain, let me know because I'd like to support you economically. And I thought, what's going on? And from then on, for the next three weeks, it was like a dream. It was unreal. All through the conference, the emphasis was it's no good just coming on a summer crusade. You need to stay here for a full year to get, to get well trained. And then when the teams were sent out, I found myself put in the same team as the fellow who had spoken to me the year before asking me to, me to pray about it. And we came to Spain 
He didn't say anything, and I didn't either. But his very presence uh, made me more and more nervous. And it came to one evening when we were going to have a night of prayer. In OM, this means that you start praying after supper, eight or nine o'clock, and you continue praying until you've exhausted all you can think of praying for, which is usually three or four in the morning. And so we were going to be having a night of prayer. Now there were eight of us on the team. And if a prayer meeting lasts half an hour, and there are eight people, you can probably get away with it if you don't pray. But if the prayer meeting lasts for hours and you don't pray, you begin to think that everybody's wondering what's up with him, why isn't he praying? And that's what happened to me. I just could not pray because I couldn't enter the Lord's presence because I knew that I hadn't prayed about what I said I'd pray for that it was obvious that the Lord was pushing me and that I wasn't willing to answer positively. And so I just couldn't pray. And so after an uncomfortable, I suppose, couple of hours, I said to the team leader, I, I don't feel very well. Um, can I go and lie down? And he graciously said yes. And so I left the prayer meeting. We were sitting on, on the ground in the countryside. And I went to my sleeping bag on the ground in the countryside under olive trees. And I went to sleep there. The following day, I knew I had to do something. And I remembered Gideon pushing out the fleece twice. And so I prayed to the Lord, if you really want me to come to Spain, make the fellow who spoke to me last summer speak to me again today. If he doesn't speak to me today, I'll know it is not your will for me to come to Spain. So the, the hours went past and he didn't say anything. And then we, were, we received instructions to move from one part of Spain to another part of Spain. So most of that day was spent traveling. And at about nine o'clock at night, we still hadn't reached the destination. We were traveling through the mountains in the northwest of Spain. And this fellow turned to me and said, David, I hadn't wanted to say anything to you because I don't want to put pre unnecessary pressure on you. But this morning in my quiet time, I felt that the Lord was telling me I had to speak to you today about what I spoke to you about last summer. Are you willing to come to Spain with me? That's so why I said, well, I'm not really sure. Um, I'll tell you in a couple of days. Gideon put out the fleece twice. So the following day, I said to the Lord, if you really, really want me to come to Spain, speak to me about it in my quiet time. Confirm it through your word. So the following day, we were on a, on a beach near the town of Corona with the Tower of Hercules in the background. That's a Roman uh, lighthouse that still exists. And 
ice high winter park to have my quiet time. And that day I was reading through the Bible systematically. Um, that day I had to read 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I read the whole chapter and with relief I found that there was no verse that said David Burt has to go to Spain. But then I was stupid and decided to read it again. And the second time I read it, the last verse struck me powerfully. We don't look at the things that are seen, but the things that are unseen. But the things that are seen are temporary, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Now that initially doesn't seem to have anything to do with my call to Spain. But the more I think about it, the more I don't think there's any verse in the whole Bible that speaks more directly to my situation at that moment. Because why didn't I want to come to Spain? Fundamentally because up till that point I was willing to serve the Lord but on my conditions. I needed to have a bubble of security. I needed to have my comfort zone. So if I got a, a job with the Ministry of Education in Britain that would mean a secure salary a secure job, then I could work towards buying a house, a car, then I could get married, then I could have children, and of course I would serve the Lord. I would go to church every Sunday, I would help with youth work initially, and I probably with time um, they would ask me to have more responsibility preaching or teaching or or becoming an elder or whatever. But I needed to serve the Lord on my conditions. And for me, going to Spain was like taking a, a leap off a cliff, not knowing what would happen to me, where I would go, how I would Hope there would be no salary, so how would I live? Looking back, how dumb I was. There's no greater guarantee in this life than God. There's no greater guarantee than doing His will. Some of my fellow students who had also decided to become teachers after a short while lost their jobs because along came Mrs. Thatcher cutting um, expenses and so being a teacher was no longer a lifetime guaranteed job whereas serving the Lord is. Well, I've taken a long time explaining it, but that's how I came to go to Spain. That's an awesome, wonderful story. Could I also just ask you just to give sort of like an overview of what has your ministry been in Spain, all from those early days mm -hmm. right till now? Yeah. Sort of just an overview look of where God has taken you. Initially, I... I worked with this other fellow um, in Madrid University. We had to get matriculated in some studies there in order to enter the campus because it was 1967 um, where there were student riots in all the, in lots of cities in Europe, particularly in Paris. 
but it also affected Spain and therefore the whole place was controlled by the Spanish police and it was impossible to get in unless you had a student card so we had to matriculate and then try to witness. It was not easy because uh, Spanish students at that time tended to go up to university from their respective high schools in groups and therefore they had already had a group of friends or companions who they associated with. So the first year we saw three conversions, one Irishman, one German and one Japanese. They were foreign students who had no friends there and therefore willing to talk and um, have conversations. But of course they all went home after one year, leaving us to start from, from zero. Meanwhile, we got to know the churches in Madrid and I found that there were one or two supposedly Christian students, evangelical students. Um, and so the pastors and elders put us in touch with them and we started a, a Bible study group but we soon found we, we couldn't introduce into the Bible study group any contacts because the attitude of the Spanish supposed Christians was so negative that it just caused a bad impression. Um, I, I remember clearly one of these students saying, our experience in the churches has been so bad that we've had to beg for the friendship of the world which being interpreted is that he was sleeping with his girlfriend. Um, anyway, uh, that was the sort of students we were working with, trying to actually lead them to the Lord because they didn't really seem to know him or to be committed as his disciples. So that was our our job and in the second year we we did begin to see some contacts uh, being more interested in Bible study. The, the Bible studies we had were usually held in the cafeteria of the faculties of the university which were very noisy places full of tobacco smoke in those days um, but they had wonderful coffee and wonderful chocolate donuts. I remember that very well. And so we would sit around the table and start studying the Bible together, having to shout to be heard. Um, and then other students would be interested and look around. Shortly after, um, a fellow was converted uh, not actually through our ministry in the university, seen a, but in a local church. His mother had received a tract under the door in those blocks of apartments that I had been evangelizing in the first summer. And she had applied for the correspondence course on the Bible that the tract offered and little by little studying the Bible with, with this course she had been converted and went to a church uh, taking her son along with her and he too was converted. The pastor of that church put him in contact with me and we became good friends and he was like Don Quixote. Um, he had no fear, he would charge at windmills without fearing anything. And so I was his Sancho Panfa and went around with him. And he broke the ice 
what was then a, thereafter a disaster, whereas I was able to pick up the pieces and work with them a bit. So that's how, how the, our evangelism developed up thereafter. He, for example, we went to the different colleges where, or residences for the students, which were mainly uh, in the hands of Catholic clergy, monks and so forth. And he would ask whether we could show Christian films in their, what was called Cine Forum, um, uh, uh, where you showed a film and then had a discussion about it. And to our surprise, in many of those, many of those residences, the clergy said yes, we could. We had a number of Billy Graham films, The Restless Ones, Lucia, and other such films. Um, the students roared with laughter every time there was a conversion scene. Um, Half of them always walked out in the middle. We had to survive the first 15 minutes of the, of the discussion afterwards with caustic comments about how bad the films were. But after a time, we were able to give our own testimonies and talk about the Lord more personally and the students changed their attitude and listened more attentively. And so, little by little, the work progressed. And for, I think it was 11 years I was involved with that. After a couple of years, we were uh, visited by the General Secretary of the International Fellowship of Evangelical Students and he invited me to, to become officially a staff worker with that fellowship, saying that they would take charge of my salary and that would free me to do more Christian work because at that time I was teaching English in order to support myself and therefore I was only able to do Christian work part-time. So I became a staff worker with IFES and little by little the student work grew until now we have Christian groups in just about, I think in every university in Spain. Um, and we've also branched out into high school work and into graduate work. But anyway, that's another story, another long story. So initially that was my work. Then after, then IFES told me that I had to work myself out of a job. In other words, um, I as a foreigner wasn't the best person to lead up the student work, therefore I had to train a Spaniard to be able to take over from me. We had, I spent 11 years doing, well, a total of 11 years doing that. The reason it took so long was because the Spanish counselors we had, them, they themselves, were happier with me as the general secretary than they were with one of the Spanish students. Um, and therefore they made objections to the different names that were proposed, but eventually we found the right student and he took over from me. Well, I didn't want to know what I'd be doing next, but just before my time came to a close. I was visited by a Baptist pastor from Barcelona 
who told me that he had Parkinson's disease and therefore he felt that he had to resign as a pastor and would like me to take over his church as pastor. Well, I had never been a pastor and I had never had pastoral experience except for the experience I'd had in the student work. So I said I'd pray about it and then we came to New Zealand. We were here for six months. The TSCF offered to pay our fare if I was willing to do three months of service with the TSCF and then have three months vacation with my parents, my sisters, which we did. And during that time we were thinking and praying about this offer from the Baptist Church in Barcelona. What year would that have been? Um, that would have been... Oh, 78, approximately, yeah. To cut a long story short, we, we finally accepted under the condition that he, the previous pastor, would serve one year more with me under him in order for him to teach me how to be a pastor. But it's quite obvious that the Lord had different ideas because almost the week after we arrived in Barcelona to take up our new position, he became very seriously ill and was in hospital for a couple of months and then in re recuperation for another couple of months. And so I suddenly found myself with a large church on my hands to pastor when I hadn't done any pastoring in the past. Um, in the first month, we had five funerals. The first funeral was of an old lady whose family uh, had attended the church at one stage, but no longer did. Um, but since the old lady was an evangelical Christian, um, the family asked that I should take the funeral. But it was a very intimate thing, mainly done in their house. In those days, the coffin was kept at home until burial. And so we had a, a little service in the house with the family and a few other leading church members present. And so it was a nice way in. Of the five funerals, the, f the last one was a big one in the sense that the person who died was a well-known social figure. He had been awarded the Cross of St. George, which is the highest civilian award in Catalonia, and uh, therefore all sorts of important people, mayors and such, were present at the funeral. Um, there were over, over a thousand people present. And, but meanwhile, the Lord had taught me through the four previous funerals, little by little, how to do it. Yeah. <coughs> so I really did feel as if I was being taught by the Lord himself. We were in that church for 13 years. Um, and saw the church grow. And then I had a stroke, which knocked me out. This was in 92. Um, it left my right side paralyzed. I could hardly speak. And during the, I obviously couldn't continue serving in the church, so I resigned from that position. 
And meanwhile, Margaret, my wife, and I were wondering, well, what has the Lord got for us now? I thought, of, thought when I recovered, maybe I should go back to teaching English and doing some sort of church service in, in my spare time. But a couple of people spoke to us and said, we don't think that's what the Lord wants you to do. You should be in full-time a service, Christian service. Um, and we would certainly be willing to help support you. But, so think about it. As I was recovering, someone anonymously gave us a computer. I, back then, had always thought, I'm never going to use a computer. I prefer a buyer and pen and paper and uh, whatever I write and all my sermon preparation and so forth, I'll do it that way. But the Lord gave me this computer when my right hand was paralyzed. Now, writing with my left hand was agony. I could try and do a, a few words, but it was hopeless. But I could learn to type on the computer with my left hand. So that's how I learned to use a computer. And I've written all, all the books I've written with the left hand on the computer ever since. Because I found that when my right hand began to move again, it was still still so awkward that when I tried using my right hand as well as, as the left, I had to spend ages correcting all the mistakes I'd made with my right hand. So, so I continued typing with my left hand only. And little by little as I recovered, the Lord opened the door for me to have an itinerant preaching and teaching ministry as well as beginning a writing ministry. The writing ministry had started when we um, participated in uh, an evangelism congress in Madrid. It was the first one uh, since the Franco regime. And we had a, a stand for the student work and people had asked us to prepare materials on the stand about evangelism. And so I, together with other people, we prepared different subjects related to that theme, general theme of evangelism. And during the Congress, um, the leader of a, an ed, a publishing house came and looked at the stand and then, then he said to me, you know, if you were to get all these materials worked up well, they could be published as a book. Would you do that for us? And so that was my, my first book. Some of the chapters were not written by me, but all of, all of them were revised by me to make them cohesive. And that was the first book. It was called How Then Shall They Hear? But that title was considered by the publishers as not being commercial. And so they changed it to Evangelism Manual for the 21st Century. It's still being published. Uh, it is actually used by a number of Bible schools for their teaching on evangelism. So that was the first book. But thereafter, I've had a writing ministry, a preaching, teaching ministry. Um, I'm invited to different churches throughout the country. 
um, after the COVID pandemia, pandemic, um, I reverted to Zoom, to giving Bible expositions by Zoom, which has its advantages and disadvantages. The disadvantages is the loss of personal contact. The advantage is that people all over the world can connect. So on Tuesday mornings I'm expounding Romans currently and on Wednesday evenings I expound Luke and I have people connecting from Mexico, from Chile, from the United States, as well as from all over Spain. That's where I'm at, more or less, now. Because I don't get to see you too often, and we've already been talking a long time, but just a couple more things. And that is, because I only have one American auntie, so I'd like to know, how did you get an American wife? I think it was must have been the third summer in Brussels in the Congress for the for the summer crusade before sending out the teams. I had to do some translation work because by then I could speak reasonable Spanish, and so I had to translate into English the talks given by people like George Verwer. Um, if you've ever heard him preach, he's a man who doesn't finish his sentences, uh, has a style of accumulating phrases which communicate the idea, but all, all the translators have to fill in the gaps he also uses a lot of plays on words, jokes which um, require subtle use of similar words which don't translate. And so the English, his English talk would be met by roars of laughter from the English speakers and then the Spaniards would be straining forward wondering what the joke was going to be and there wasn't, wasn't one it was because it was untranslatable. Anyway um, I was doing the translation and my wife Margaret who I'd never met yet was sitting among the Spanish group because she had learnt Spanish in Mexico with OM had come to Europe for the summer crusade and wanted to learn more Spanish and so sat with them in order to have the English version followed by the Spanish version and uh, thus learn more. Um, so she met me in Brussels I met her in Seville, which is much more romantic. Um, that summer I was in charge of three evangelistic teams that worked from Seville, trying to cover the whole of Seville province, town by town, village by village, with track distribution, book sales, and general conversation with people. But unfortunately we had one of the team leaders was hopeless and so I found myself ha pretty well having to lead the team instead of him. Uh, Margaret was in a different team and so I didn't really get to know her. However, when we, when we travelled back to Madrid from Seville after the campaign she, I was driving and she sat next to me and in OM there was the norm that the person sitting next to the driver had to maintain conversation so that the driver wouldn't fall asleep. And so Margaret had already worked out 
a huge sheet of questions that she wanted to ask me um, in order to keep me awake. After about the twentieth question, I thought, "Oh, this woman, when when she when she gonna stop asking questions?" Um, so my first impression was not positive. Meanwhile, her first impression of me had not been positive because she'd seen how George w w w was so dynamic preaching and me translating was poor and therefore she didn't think I'd done a good job. So that was how we first met. She then returned to the States, um, but I was sending out then a newsletter and she got on my list to receive it. And from time to time she wrote asking more questions. She came back after a couple of years when I had become interested in another girl, um, another American actually. Uh, and I think, well I know that she was interested in me too. In OM, you're not, you, no one was allowed to start a relationship, a sentimental relationship during the year. You had to wait, wait till the following summer before saying anything. And so I waited until the summer and then I spoke to this girl and said that I'd like to have a deeper relationship. And her reply was, I'm in love with you, but the Lord has called you to Spain and the Lord is calling me to India. So there's nothing doing. We're not made for each other and therefore I don't think we can start a deeper relationship. That was the beginning of summer. At the end of summer, Margaret appeared, but I was so stunned by the first girl's answer the last thing I felt like doing was starting a relationship with, with another, another one. However, as time went on, I was very fortunate. I was almost the only eligible bachelor on the team. There was the car mechanic who was always covered, always covered with black grease. There was a deaf fellow with um, hearing aids. Hearing aids that whistled, <laughs> um, and me, the only bachelors. Whereas there was a wide selection of females. I had a black Jamaican two blonde Swedes, one red-headed Danish girl, um, several Americans and Brits, and I being the only Ill eligible bachelor, I was fairly much bombarded with looks and sighs and the only person who didn't show any interest in me was Margaret. So that was probably her tactic to get me hooked. And it worked. <laughs> I sort of feel we're still just scratching the surface of what you could share on some of your missions work in Spain, but it, we've got people calling for lunch. So I'll just ask you just to really sort of wrap up just by thinking of maybe the people who have been watching and listening who've got a call of God on their lives and really just some final comments just to encourage them to how to discern God's will and pursue that calling. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I've told you my story or some parts of it. Um, but I want to emphasize that each of us has a different story. We are not clones. There are certain principles that are true of every believer, but God works in our lives individually, distinctly. And therefore, you shouldn't think that God has to work in your life as he did in mine. But I would encourage you with that text from 2 Corinthians 4:18. Uh, to understand that the really important things in life are, are not the things that can be seen. They're the spiritual things. They're the God things. There is no greater security than being in God's will. It may lead you to martyrdom, but so what? There's a glory after. And meanwhile, we live in the security of God's faithful provision, of God's faithful guiding, of His giving us what we need for every situation. So, don't continue looking at the things that are seen but rather as the things are not, that are not seen, because the things that are seen are temporary, whereas those that are not seen are eternal. So I just want to give special thanks to my uncle for sharing today and also just coming over for my mum, your little sister's funeral, and that's one of our treasures in heaven with the Lord now. But I'd like to ask you to pray for everyone who's watching and you're welcome to pray in Spanish and we'll, I don't know hardly anything of Spanish, but I'll receive the blessing through your prayer. Padre, yo no sé quién escuchará este testimonio, pero tú sí. Tú conoces el corazón de cada persona y tú tienes planes para la vida de cada persona. Y pido que mi pobre testimonio pueda servir para animar, consolar, corregir, desafiar a cualquier persona que esté escuchando esta gra grabación. Bendice a tu pueblo, bendice a estos oyentes. Te lo pedimos en el nombre del Señor Jesucristo. Amén.